I'm Maureen Bellatori, and this is Spilled Salt, a podcast on the thrills and spills from the food, beverage, and agriculture industries. Today's guest is Jim Trezice. He's the president of Wine America. He's been there since 2017 after serving for more than 20 years on that organization's board of directors and executive committee, but he spent 35 years at the New York Wine and Grape Foundation and actually created that entity as well. Um, and so he talks about that on the podcast today, how the New York Wine and Grape Foundation was established, um, as well as the state of the wine industry, um, especially in the U.S. There's some international references, too. But um, a big part of the story that I wanted to get across from Jim is what's going on with the bigger picture of the wine industry as it relates to the anti-alcohol movement. Um, consumer preferences and um, some of the U.S. dietary guidelines that are coming down the pike uh, as well. Um, Jim also mentioned something that I'm wildly passionate about that comes up on a number of these shows, which is collaboration, uh, which is rampant in the wine industry as well as any uh, many other agricultural industries as well. Enjoy the conversation. Hey there, Jim. How are you today? I'm wonderful, Maureen. How are you? It's another I'm perfect day on Cuca Lake. <laughs> I love to hear it. I'm really excited that we're starting to get into the fall seasons too, and the weather is starting to change and, you know, all the leaves and everything. It's a great time of year in the Finger Lakes. It is. Yes. Love it. Well, you, I'm so excited to have you on the show today. You have been in the wine and grape industry since 1982. Can you talk a little bit about your work leading up to the work that you're doing now? Yeah, um, it was kind of a crazy situation that got me here, but I'm so delighted that it happened. I won't go into it because it would take the whole half hour. Um, but in uh, on Valentine's Day of 1982, uh, my ex-wife and I each drove a, a U-Haul from Philadelphia uh, for 10 hours through a blizzard to get to Penn Yen, New York, and start a new job as the executive director of the New York State Wine Grape Growers. And they had uh, gotten a marketing order um, to, to do promotion and research programs, which they asked me to come and put together. So that was the beginning of it. And again, it was the grape farmers. It was not the wineries, um, but the farmers have always been, had great vision uh, looking ahead to you know see what needs to be done and that kind of thing. So that was my introduction to it. Um, and it turned out, Maureen, that at that time, the industry was in a crisis um, for a number of different reasons, which I won't get into. But it was an economic crisis and it was in danger of extension, not to exaggerate at all. Um, and so uh, I was working with these folks, wonderful people, the, the grape farmers. Um, and one day in 1983, fall of 1983, the New York Times ran a, um, a front page article on the regional section um, that had, was headlined, New York Grape Industry in Crisis. And uh, Mario Cuomo, the governor at that time, read the article. He called his commissioner of agriculture, Joe Girasi, uh, and said, I want a solution on my desk by noon on Monday. This was Friday afternoon. Want a solution to the crisis on my desk by noon on Monday. Joe Girasi called me and he said, Jim, I need a solution to the crisis um, in Chautauqua by noon on Sunday. And so I called my wife and I said, I'm not coming home tonight. I'm pulling an all nighter. Uh, I've got I've got to solve a crisis. And at that time, there were no computers, really. I mean, maybe the original ones, but I had an IBM Selectric with whiteout. And that's why, unfortunately, I took a typing course in high school and I usually don't have to edit my writing so much. So I came up with a four point plan of what the state could do. And I said, the industry has to change as well, but here are the things that you could do. And I gave it to Joe Girasi, who took it to Mario Cuomo. And I heard nothing for three months. And I just said, okay, that was a total bomb. And then in January of 1984, front page of the New York Times, not the regional section, the front page of the Times said, Governor Cuomo is going to help the grape and wine industry. And he basically, without letting me know, had endorsed the four, four points that I, I laid out for him. Um, and so he basically got the things going. I all of a sudden became a lobbyist, uh, not expecting <laughs> to, and spent, you know, the first six months of that year commuting to Albany back and forth. And we ended up getting all four. 
uh, including the creation of the New York Wine and Grape Foundation for promotion and research. So that was the beginning. Um, and the foundation was a public-private partnership. So the state of New York every year uh, put up a certain amount of matching funds, which we could get only if we put up an equal amount of private sector funds. Um, and also there were, were um, uh, restrictions saying you have to spend at least 30 percent, well, at least 25 up to 40 percent of the money on research. And it usually averaged about 30. And so that money went to Cornell. Uh, and it was really good that it, it did, which I'll get to back to in a minute. And the rest of it went to promotion. And so I was basically the promotion guy um, with help from other people as well and a couple of PR agencies along the way. And so we created a bunch of programs for the New York grape and wine industry um, to promote the wine trails, which exist. Uh, now there are 20 of them across the state. There was one at the time and um, also to promote Uncork New York, which was our slogan uh, for everything that we did. And then we had the research program uh, at Cornell. And the mission that I created for the New York Wine and Grape Foundation uh, was to have the New York grape and wine industry recognized as a world leader in quality, productivity, and social responsibility. If you think of those things, all of them require research. Quality requires research, productivity requires research, and social responsibility like sustainability. And so between the promotion that we were able to do and the research that Cornell did, uh, it really transformed the industry. And I'll also get back to when this originally happened. So in, in 1983, 84, the industry was in a crisis. After these pieces of legislation were um, were created, were passed, uh, within about three years, the New York grape and wine industry became the fastest growing industry in the agriculture and tourism sectors. And so that's not a pat on my back. What it shows is that, you know, in this business, we're always talking about the climate because you have to have a good climate to grow good grapes to make great wine. But people forget that the business climate has to be good if you're going to grow an industry. And that was the lesson I learned, which is that public policy is every bit as important as everything else that we do. And it's created by human beings. Can't do much about the weather other than respond to it. But we can educate human beings to say, if you do A, B, and C, it's going to help us grow. If we grow, we're going to pay more taxes and hire more people. So that's kind of a a quick snapshot of the evolution of the, the New York Wine and Grape Foundation. And I uh, ran it with wonderful colleagues for about 35 years. And what was what prompted your decision to move on from the Wine and Grape Foundation into, you went from there to Wine America, which is where you are now, correct? Correct. And that was uh, about seven years ago. And there were a couple of things that prompt, prompted me to do it. First of all, I had been on the board of directors and executive committee of Wine America for 30 years. So I knew the organization. Um, it was going through some difficult transitions. I thought that I might be able to help it um, by becoming more directly involved um, as, a, as, a, as a real consultant rather than just on the board. Other people felt the same way as well. And I also uh, felt that, um, you know, probably uh, somebody else could take the New York Wine and Grape Foundation to a new level uh, that I couldn't. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was you know, with the new communications and social media and that kind of thing, which I wasn't that familiar with. Um, and I'm really glad that I did it because Sam Filler, who is the executive director now and a good friend, uh, he was the one that we chose appropriately. And he and his team really have taken it to uh, to a new level. And I had the, the pleasure of working with several of the people who are still there, uh, Jen Cooper, Dana uh, Alexander, Kim Hughes, and so forth. So it was a smooth transition. Nothing was lost. He changed some things, as he should, um, mm -hmm. and he's made it all the better. So I'm happy because, in a sense, it was myself and Mario Cuomo that created it. 
So it's like a child to me. And you always want your child to do well and grow up and be is successful. And the, and the New York Wine and Grape Foundation is. So good for them. Well, and, you know, you're good for you. You know, I mean, the it sounds like the industry itself has thrived significantly thanks to your leadership um, at that organization. And one of the things that I love about agriculture is that there's so many fringe benefits to agriculture thriving, right? It makes strong communities, you know, um, and so you, although you strike me as a guy who wouldn't want to receive credit for <laughs> strengthening the communities of the state of New York as a result of this work, I, I'm sure that you have done that. So you're now at Wine America. What does Wine America do? Wine America, I describe as the little association that could. And by that, I mean, there's three of us. You're looking at a one third of the staff right here. Uh, but it's a national organization of American wineries. So we have winery members uh, from all from uh, 47 of the 50 states. We're working on the other three. But what that means is that we can walk into 94 Senate offices in D.C. and say, we represent some of your constituents, the wineries in your state. Um, and uh, we basically focus on federal public policy. Um, so as an example that has tangible benefits for every winery in the country, uh, several years ago, we, with our colleagues, uh, our collaborators, were able to get a law passed called the Craft Beverage Modernization and Tax Reform Act. What it did is lower the excise taxes for wineries of all sizes. So as an example, if you make 30,000 gallons of wine um, for the first 30,000, you get a $1 credit on your taxes. The normal tax is $1.07, you ended up paying seven cents. So for that first 30,000 gallons, you're saving $30,000. You can do whatever you want with it. You can hire new people, you can give raises to existing people, buy more tank barrels, marketing, and that kind of thing. And it goes all the way up to, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of savings for the largest wineries. And so that's uh, an example where we were able to uh, increase the productivity of the industry by letting the industry keep more of its money. Um, we're also working on a bill to allow the U.S. Post Office to ship wine across state borders like FedEx and UPS can right now. In fact, it's just recently been introduced, and one of the co-sponsors is our own Senator Kirsten Gillibrand um, with Jeff Merkley of, of Oregon. So that's something that's not going to happen this year. Nothing's going to happen this year, but uh, we wanted to get it introduced. We also work on the Farm Bill, which happens every five years. And the Farm Bill is something that's very important to the New York and every other industry. Uh, first of all, there's a lot of money for research in there. Some of it stays with USDA, but a lot of it out, is out there for grants. And I know that um, the New York Wine and Grape Foundation, uh, and I think some uh, some regional groups have gotten some grants uh, for research under, uh, under USDA. It also has the uh, market access program map and what that is for all agriculture, including wine, is funding to increase exports of American agricultural products, including wine. And we started uh, a, an export program, my goodness, probably 30 years ago now with MAP funding. And my colleague, Susan Spence, uh, who's now retired, she really was the one that did all the work. But we started from scratch and now it's a very robust program. And I can I can say for sure it would not exist without that MAP funding from USDA. And then there's value added grants. There's a number of other things as well. And um, uh, it's a really good, important bill. It's coming down to the wire now uh, yeah. you know, with, with the negotiations. It may or may not be in anything that's passed this week, but at some point it's going to happen. And Right now, we actually like the shape of it uh, because they're going to increase the MAP funding. So we're working on that. And then the final thing I'll mention, which is basically damage control, is something that's called the U.S. Dietary Guidelines. And every five years, um, the, the federal government, uh, HHS and, and others, they came, come out with um, guidelines for eating. 
you know, fruits, vegetables, <laughs> grains, and that kind of thing. And for the past several iterations, alcohol uh, has been part of it. And they do not encourage consumption of alcohol, but they say if you choose to, then it's generally regarded as safe that um, a man can have two doses a day and a woman one dose a day. In the case of wine, a dose would be five ounces of wine uh, mm -hmm. each. And the difference between male and female it mostly has to do with, with body size, uh, but more than that, metabolism, because females metabolize alcohol differently than men. So that is going on right now and not in a good way. So we are in the middle of working with our colleagues at Wine Institute, the spirits people, the beer people, and so forth, to make sure that the process is transparent and based on sound science. So that's uh, that's something that's right at the top of our agenda right now, because technically it should be done this year, 2024, so it goes into effect 2025. So that's uh, number one right now. That's the biggest fire we're fighting. And so what do you mean? Can you talk a little bit more about that? You mentioned that's not going well. It's the biggest fire you're fighting. Talk more about that. Well, um, you know, there's a lot where we're facing several major challenges right now. So let me stick with this one uh, for right now. You know, there's, there's a very uh, large anti-alcohol movement that's being stimulated by the World Health Organization. Um, and it's, it's global. And the whole idea is that there's no safe level uh, of alcohol, that even a drink a day is going to cause cancer or something like that. Um, people are very sensitive to that, especially the younger generation. So if, for example, the dietary guidelines were changed um, from what they are now, which is the two doses, one dose, um, then there would be a lot of people who may otherwise, you know, have a glass of wine or a beer um, or, or, you know, a mixed drink or something like that, who just say, no, I'm not going to have any at all, or I'm going to cut down and so forth. Uh, and maybe they should. Everybody has to make their own decisions, uh, but it could very much uh, affect um, the future of the grape and wine industry. And I say grape and wine because if wine goes down, grapes go down. And you have mm -hmm. to have grapes right. to make wine. So it's, it's an agricultural issue as well as other things as well. Um, it's very complicated. Um, uh, I'm hopeful that it's going to work out okay, but we don't really have a sense of timing at this, at this point. And so some of what we've talked about, Jim, is a delicate balance as it relates to that issue that you just discussed, right, of what Wine America and other organizations that are in that space can and cannot do as it relates to that issue. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, we have. There are three um areas on our website. Our website is wineamerica.org. Very simple. Um, and the first one, which relates to this, is called Compliance Matters. And that's uh, in two senses. Number one, compliance is very important. If you want to stay in business, you have to obey the law. We are very, very heavily regulated. Uh, so we want people to know what they can and cannot do. Um, and then these are compliance matters. So here are the things that you need to you need to know. Um, and so we ha it's not legal advice. We're not in a position to give legal advice, but it's general information with links um, to government sources and to the laws and regulations that we're talking about. So as one example, we cover direct to consumer shipment. Where can you ship? What are the rules? How do you pay the taxes and that kind of thing? Uh, another one has to do with wine and health. What can you as a licensed winery or we as a, an organization representing licensed wineries, what can we say about wine and health? Uh, and the answer is virtually nothing. Uh, even if it's backed up by science, sound science. So we obey that law. We don't, and we're also not qualified. I'm not a physician. I'm not a scientist. Um, so it's something where we want to make people aware of it. Uh, so they say, stay out of trouble. And there are other people who are, who are looking at that. So there's the compliance part of it. The other, there are two things that we can say as much as we want. 
And one of them is in a section called The Magic of Wine. And I wrote this over the over the uh, year end holidays last year. And it basically it talks about wine as farming. It talks about wine as an economic engine. It talks about wine as an inspiration of poets and philosophers. Uh, throughout the ages, who have come up with these wonderful quotes. There's a couple hundred quotes uh, in there called Wine Words. <clears throat> and also, there's a list of the toasts, cheers, uh, in various languages around the world. And there's just a bunch of information that, say, that, that shows that wine is a cultural phenomenon and has been for 8,000 years. So it's not new. It's been with us in all cultures around the world, Wine is used to, to toast all kinds of things, ship launchings, peace treaties, weddings, you know, births, graduations, just having fun. Uh, and so it's truly, if, wine, if, if music is the international uh, language, wine, wine is the international toast. It's the thing that makes people mm -hmm. happy and shows happiness as well. So there's a whole bunch of that stuff on the website, which I encourage people to have fun with, take a look at, laugh at download it and use it uh, because we can say that it's really true and it's backed up by you know a lot of history and so forth and then the other section so we have compliance matters we have the magic of wine and the other section is called economics and within that section uh, is our uh, 2022 national economic impact of the wine industry and it's, it's a study that was done by a very good firm called John Dunham and Associates, very highly regarded, um, doing economics in the area of public policy. And it has the uh, statistics, detailed statistics uh, on a national level and for all 50 states. So New York has its own section. And um, basically what it showed in 2022 is that, the, uh, is that wine uh, generated 276 billion with a B dollars for the U.S. economy. It's about two percent of gross domestic product. Um, and what's really interesting about it, Maureen, is that it's not. You think about wine as wine making, you know, Fox Run, which is a great winery, or Dr. Frank, or some, or you know, Glenora, what have you. That's a big part of it. But there are three stages. There's direct, which is the winery part is the grape grower and winery part there's supplier and there's indirect so direct means the vineyard to the winery to the wholesaler to the retailer and tourism and tourism is a huge part uh, of this impact penyan new york where i live is a little town that has been transformed by tourism uh, over the past decades uh, as have many others as well. Um, and so that's the that's the direct impact. Supplier impact means Waterloo Container, you know, is a huge supplier of bottles and boxes and that kind of thing around the country, you know, and they're in, in Waterloo, New York. And if you're going to have a winery, you have to have tanks and barrels and tractors and all kinds of different things and, and uh, communications, accountants, you know, you name it. There's all these people who supply goods and services. And then the third level is called induced impact, and that's on the community. So here in Penyan, it's the grocery stores, it's the gas stations, it's the hotels. You know, it's all, everybody benefits uh, when the wine industry is, is doing well. And for New York, you know, I said the, the national figure is $276 billion. For New York, it's almost $15 billion. Um, and all the statistics uh, are on the website. You know, how many jobs, how many wineries are there, how many jobs, how many tourists, how, what are tourist expenditures, how much in taxes um, are paid by wine and that kind of thing. So um, that is another thing we can talk freely about. And I encourage people to do that, especially when we're talking with legislators, because we as consumers might be interested in aroma bouquet and taste the legislators want to know know about jobs and and um and wages and taxes and so economic impact is one of the things that's going to um shield us from the worst of what's coming along right because that is something you can safely speak to and you can't speak to health you know Correct. and so i i get that and why not emphasize that, right? The the impact that the industry has from an economic standpoint. 
What about you personally? You've been in the wine industry for a long time. What's one thing that you love about it, about the industry? <laughs> the people, <laughs> the yeah. people. And I have a saying, you know, I, I have a lot of really bad poetry. You have to get used to me. But, you know, the saying is that the product is a pleasure, but the people are the treasure. And and I really I love I love wine. You know, I have since, uh, you know, my, my college days um, and I'm delighted and, and privileged to be in the wine industry. But I've had the opportunity and, and the pleasure of meeting wine people literally from around the world, many of them in their own backyards, in Europe, in Australia, in New Zealand and other places as well. And it doesn't matter where they're from. It doesn't matter what language they speak. Um, it doesn't matter what kind of grapes they grow or anything like that. Wine people are passionate. They are passionate about what they do. They're passionate about preserving the earth. Um, they're fun. They love to have a glass of wine together and eat together and talk and trade jokes and, and that kind of thing. And I think that's one of the reasons that many people in the wine industry live very long lives. Uh, as an example, some of the, the California icons, uh, Andre Chelichev lived to be 92, Robert Mondavi, 94, Ernest Gallo, 97, um, Mike Gergich recently, 100. And there's other people, 100 and 102, who are still living uh, and even working. And so I, it's not necessarily the wine, the liquid per se. I think it's the happiness that people derive from being part of a community and having friends who share the same passion and, and so forth. So uh, it's that. But, I, I, you know, that's my favorite thing. But I love all the aspects of it. I love the farming part. You know, and at this time in, in, uh, in New York State, you drive outside and the Concord grapes are ripe. And it's like perfume. You know, it's like <laughs> perfume in the air. It's wonderful. And the gra all grapes are so beautiful. All the different colors. Every vintage is different. You know, and the winemakers are a lot of fun because they're very well trained. Um, but they also have to be artists. So they have to know the, the science, but they also have to be, be artists to make decisions about, okay, what I have these wonderful grapes. What's the best thing I can do with them? And there are decisions all along the way. And then I'm not a research guy, honestly, but I have come to respect you know, the, the people at Cornell and everything they have done uh, for our industry. So it's just, a, and then the end, of, end product, is something that's endlessly variable. You know, I've judged in about 300 wine competitions um, over my career and tasted about a million wines, and they're all different. So there's just so much to like, and, and to me, very little not to like. <laughs> I agree. We had um, a great interview with Matt Schrader from Gallo Winery um, on, I think it was on season one or season two, of the podcast. Um, and he's one of the winemakers there and he was talking about, you know, what it take, I was asking him, what does it take to develop a new wine for Gallo? And he kind of, you know, spoke about that. It was a fascinating discussion. And so anybody who's interested in that component of it, go look for that episode. I think you'll enjoy it. Um, I want you to speak to, there's a campaign that is going on this month called come over October. What is that all about? It's awesome. Uh, it's really great. And, you know, it's going on right now. And um, I hope people are enjoying it in different ways. So I have a good friend from decades ago, uh, Karen McNeil, uh, and she and I did a little promotion um, decades ago to commemorate the statue of anniversary of the Statue of Liberty coming to New York and so forth. And wine was a little bit part of it. And so I've known her for a long time. Unfortunately, she moved to Napa, but she is one of the foremost wine writers and the author of a book called The Wine Bible. And um, she came up with this idea in response to uh, what is going to be Sober October, uh, and, you know, which is to encourage people to not drink anything at all, whatever. And, and she just woke up one morning and said, you know, uh, this is kind of crazy. Why are people doing this? Wine is a good thing. It brings people together. You know, it's family, it's friends, and it makes them happy. So why not encourage people to share a glass of wine? And that was the genesis of the idea. And then there are two other colleagues, uh, Kimberly Charles and Gina Colangelo, 
um, who are uh, involved with it as well. So the three, Karen called the two of them up and said, this is either a crazy idea or a good idea. What do you think? And they said, it's a good idea. And the three of them have been donating their time. These are top flight professionals to put together this promotion. So the whole idea is for anybody in any way they want to share wine with other people, with family, with friends, with total strangers. You know, go to a restaurant, come over to my house, uh, have a watch party, uh, and just you know, don't make it all formal and that kind of thing. Uh, and obviously, be responsible, be safe. And one of the sponsors is Lyft, um, so that mm -hmm. if people and there's a there's a special rate during October that if you want to use Lyft, you get a discount. You know, that's that's tied to come over October. And so a number of places are using it in a number of different ways. Uh, and the the wineries themselves have gotten involved. I'm proud to say that Wine America um, was the first organization to publicly support come over October. And we have done a whole bunch of uh, amplification, if you will, and encouraging people to to get involved. And then recently. On September 25th in Washington, we held a congressional wine reception that was the official kickoff to come over October. And so this was the ultimate way to say wine can bring people together. If it can bring the warring Democrats and warring Republicans together to have a glass of wine and be civil to each other, you know, that's a pretty decent thing. And that's the kind of thing yeah. that wine <laughs> So that but, anything no, can happen. Yeah, yeah, it's a great it's a great promotion. I thank you for asking. I, I hope people uh, look for it and take part in it as well. And where's the best way to for listeners to learn more about that campaign on the is is there a website for it? Uh, yeah, it just come over October dot com. Yep. Excellent. What is something that you think the wine and grape industry needs? Um, unity. And another of my sayings is that diversity is our strength, unity is our power. And by that, I mean, what makes us interesting is that we are diverse. You know, we, we're diverse regions. We have we grow different types of grapes. We make different types of wines. We have all kinds of opinions, you know, so we're, we're you know, we're very diverse. But if we set all that aside and come together with a clear message to, that, to say, we all believe in this, we all need this, we will work for this, uh, we're unstoppable. And what happened in 1984, 1985, it wasn't just me, it was the grape growers, it was New York Farm Bureau, it was a whole bunch of people working together to make things happen. And this is what we need right now um, in this country. And I'll tell you why we talked a little bit about the anti-alcohol movement, which is, is very real and very, uh, very serious. There are a few other challenges that are facing us as well. Climate change is very real. Um, and we're an agricultural product. So here in the Finger Lakes, we used to routinely make ice wines. Uh, we can't do that anymore. Most of the years, it doesn't get cold enough for the great. Oh, really? I didn't realize that. It used to be consistent and now it is totally inconsistent. We can't count on it. And so there's a specialty uh, that we're, you know, that we're losing and, uh, and the climate change affects every region in, in the world. So fortunately our industry um, is very astute and we can kind of see things coming, but that's one of the things that we have to face and we have to take action uh, there legislatively in other ways as well. In addition, there are generational changes um, you know, a lot of the younger people are, number one, not not drinking alcohol as much at all and or shifting their preferences. There are these uh, ready to drink cocktails that you see in grocery stores everywhere and so forth. Very convenient. A lot of them are very good. They're made by the spirits companies. Um, and so the marketing has been very good as well. And we have unprecedented um, competition from them. Uh, so that's another thing. And there are other challenges that are facing us. So there's four or five altogether, but I have been around long enough to see that uh, this is a cyclical industry and we have good times and bad times. We have easy times yeah. and hard times. And if we all work together, we will get through this and we will, because we paid attention and worked together and created new solutions, we will be better and healthier and stronger on the other side of this than we've ever been before. I love that. Last question for you. What do you think is next for the industry? 
Better times. Uh, not immediately. I think we're going to go through a year uh, or two of challenge. That doesn't necessarily mean bad times, but we're going to have to do a lot of soul searching and a lot of working together, as I just described. But I think that wine is here to stay. It's been here, you know, for centuries, for millennial. Um, and it's a very, very magical beverage. So what we need to do is kind of look inward and outward. Um, and, and, and communicate with each other and help each other. And fortunately, uh, Maureen, that's collaboration is part of the DNA of the wine industry. And um, the people here in the Finger Lakes especially, they help each other. You know, when there's a new winery uh, that's going to open up, they don't look at it as competition. They look at it as, you know, a new collaborator and they help it out. You know, they talk with the winemakers. They they let them, you know, use their tank space or what have you. And so as long as we work together um, and recognize what are the things that we can do things something about and we take action, then we're going to be fine. So I'm very optimistic. We're, we're here to stay and we're here to be better. I think that that's an important um, like differentiation that you made. You mentioned that the wine industry needs unity, and I'm glad that you sort of explained that, that the collaboration is already here, and that opportunity for unity and coming together is something that can continue to happen, and even though we already have the collaboration piece. Yes. And, and, you know, come over October is a good example on a consumer level of that, meaning uh, the people involved with come, o come over October, it's now international. I mean, it, it's going all around the, uh, around the world and all around the country. So we have you know, wineries from California, from New York, from Virginia, Michigan, every, everybody's getting into the act. And it's really great to have a central theme. Um, and to mm -hmm. say, okay, we can all rail, we can all agree to this. We can all rally around it. And so, what Wine America does on a national level is say, okay, we can all agree. We'd like the post office to to you know ship our wines, and we'd all you know we all want this to happen as well. And so, when we can all come together, we are so powerful. It's amazing. I agree. Jim, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing the state of the industry. Um, it was once I chatted with you a couple of weeks ago, it was important for me to have an opportunity to share this story about the bigger picture of what's going on. And so I appreciate um, being able to learn a little more about your story and the impact that you've had in the wine industry, um, as well as share that story a bit. So thank you so much for taking the time. Oh, and thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure. And uh, I encourage everybody to, uh, to enjoy wine responsibly, preferably New York wine, because that's where I'm from. <laughs> I'll second that. Um, also from the, from the Finger Lakes here. And so um, enjoy. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to Spilled Salt. I'm your host, Maureen Bellatori. Spilled Salt is an Agency 29 production. Agency 29 is a brand building firm for food, beverage, and agriculture brands. Learn more at agency29.com. For more information about the podcast, visit spilledsaltpodcast.com. Use that website to send me questions or recommendations for future guests. I always love hearing from you. Spilled Salt is available anywhere you enjoy your podcasts. Please like and subscribe so you never miss an episode.